so I am uh, Matt Coleman, and um, uh, Rocky Divorce is my third book, uh, and my first in a, uh, a Rocky series of mysteries, which follows Rocky Champignol, uh, who is a amateur sleuth type of character. Uh, I'll be reading today from chapter six. So at this point in the novel, we have, we have met Rocky Champignol. We have learned that she is recently divorced uh, out of a, what was a very bad marriage to a not so great guy. And she has been pulled kicking and screaming into the local chapter of her, uh, in her town, Texarkana, which is my hometown, basis of the book. Uh, she's been pulled kicking and screaming into her local chapter of the Junior League of Texarkana, which for those of you who do not know what that is, that is a, a, woman, a women's charity group, wonderful, wonderful group of, of women um, who do great work, great charity. And, uh, but, but Rocky is a little cynical about the, the women of the Junior League and their socialite status. I think you could put it. So she's been pulled into this by her cousin, Jen, who is also trying to convince Rocky to help solve a series of home invasion robberies that are happening to some of the older members of the Junior League, because Jen believes that if Rocky were to do this, which is in her skill set, that they would solidify their position in the Junior League. League. So she has she's trying her hardest to convince Rocky to help with this. Um, Rocky is not interested and um, is simply going along because she does find the causes that they're working for worthwhile and she believes that Jen is pulling and pulling her along to help raise some money for some of the causes that they're working on. So that's where we are. We in chapter six and with that I will jump right into it. After spending her Sunday zombified by the news about Waverly St. Laurent, Rocky wanted to spend her whole Monday in bed, at least until her junior league fundraising meeting at three. Jen, however, subscribed to far different ideas. She barraged Rocky with a text campaign for them to keep a lunch date Jen made on their behalf. Rocky held strong until mid-morning when the rumbling in her stomach began to overshadow the buzzing of her phone. When Jen pulled up in Rocky's parents' driveway, the smile on her face made Rocky almost gag. Stop smiling, would you? She flopped her fry hobo bag into the floorboard and adjusted her flouncy dress as she settled into the passenger seat. Rocky turned her oversized sunglasses toward Jen and snarled, I was hungry, don't gloat. Not gloating, just smiling. Jen tittered as she threw the car into drive and circled around toward the road. Well, you look like a simpleton. Rocky reclined her seat back and closed her eyes behind the sunglasses. Who are we meeting? Dorothy Dingledowd. Rocky laughed. What the fuck? Dorothy Dingledowd is not a real person. That's the name of a Dickens character in some story about midwives. I think she goes by Dot. Rocky shook her head without raising it or opening her, opening her, her eyes. No one goes by Dot, Jen. Cartoon mice don't even do it anymore. I think there was an uprising. Rocky, Jen cut her eyes at her passenger. Can you please try to be nice, please? Ms. Dingledowd is a sustainer. She helps fund a lot of those projects. Yeah, about that. Why are we still having this meeting? Didn't the Honorable Miss Shotgun Divorce St. Laurent fund the whole thing? Jen raised an eyebrow. No one's sure what happens with her donation now. Obviously, recent events could affect the timeline, at the very least. Besides, each new member class is responsible for a fundraiser to go along with their service project. So even if we get funded, we still have to plan a fundraiser. Did you hear that? Rocky leaned toward Jen. My cynicism groaned. My inner snark couldn't even be bothered to comment. She was just like, ugh, you guys, I'm going back to sleep. That was your stomach. She punched Rocky's shoulder. Come on, you can't, can't spell fundraiser without F-U-N. Rocky rubbed at her shoulder and pouted. I stopped listening after F-U. 
Rocky ate almost every meal at local eateries, a habit she picked up from her father. Chains and fast food restaurants deluged Texarkana, but Raquel Champignol didn't eat at Chili's. So Jen drove them across town to a locally owned restaurant called Steel and Stone. As they pulled into the parking lot, Rocky croaked out and drove all the way across town. This better be Steel and Stone. She sat up and peered over her sunglasses. Okay, I wanna eat on the patio, Jen interrupted. I know, I told her, now come on, we're late. During Rocky's 11th grade year, she charmed her way into, into a position as a student aide in the counselor's office. Her goal, which she achieved, was to access her schedule for her senior year of high school and leave first period blank. Rocky never made it on time to anything. Once inside, the hostess informed Jen that she had seated the party they were meeting on the patio. Rocky pushed her sunglasses into her hair as they weaved their way behind the spry 16-year-old guiding them to their table. As they stepped on the patio, really more of a partially covered deck, Rocky laughed audibly. Jen elbowed her in the stomach, to which Rocky replied, what? Jesus, look at her, Jen. I take back my previous objections. This woman is totally a dot. Dorothy Dot Dingledowd wore a pair of reading glasses hanging onto her nose for dear life. As they started her way, she flipped them down to hang by their bejeweled string around her neck and pulled the thick-lensed John Lennon round glasses out, down out of her hair to get a better eyeful of Rocky and Jen. She wore her hair, her most composed feature, in a neat bob. One Rocky thought, not unlike what one would imagine a cartoon mouse might ask for if she were to be granted a head full of hair and a $15 gift certificate to Supercuts. Even in the heat of summer, she wore loose, flowy, and layered clothing while Rocky wore a silky summer dress and Jen a stylish pair of cuffed shorts with a striped top. Dot sported a cardigan over a cardigan. She wore an ankle length dress of many colors and croc sandals. Jen gave a broad smile and greeted Dot for them both. Miss Dingledowd, so nice to see you again. Thanks for meeting with us. Call me Dot, please, and thank you. I never socialize, if I'm not careful. I could let myself turn into a recluse. I appreciate a reason to meet someone. She turned to Rocky. You must be Raquel. Rocky flashed her people smile, flipping the cynical switch into the off position and going full tilt social butterfly. Yes, ma'am. Jen here has told me all about you. So interesting. Jen cut her eyes at Rocky as they all settled at the table. Dot fluttered her eyes and grinned. Oh. Like what? Well, Rocky placed her fingers on her bare chest in a delicate strum between the collarbones. I so wish I'd learned an instrument. I always love to meet someone who's musically inclined, especially a pianist. I'm filled with such a delightful mixture of envy and wonder. Dot blushed. So sweet of you to say. I'm not sure I consider myself a true pianist. I a dabble, I suppose. She frowned at Jen. I wasn't aware you knew. Jen shrugged. Oh, modesty. Rocky laughed and shook her head. I would imagine you would also refer to yourself as a bird watcher. She squinted one eye. But our granny used to tell us the difference between being a bird watcher and being a true birder. Dot's eyes grew wide and she looked back and forth between the two champignol girls. Jen swallowed a lump in her throat, but Rocky never broke stride. Our granny used to keep us enthralled for hours, rattling off names of rare birds she spotted right here in Arkansas. Dot nodded, bristling with enthusiasm. Oh, oh, yes, you, you would be amazed at the birds I've seen. People think we're a state full of mockingbirds and blue jays, but let me tell you, one trip up to Rocky completed Dot's sentence along with her, nodding and pointing, Eureka Springs. They both chortled, and Jen joined in with shaky, nervous, breathy laughs. Dot reached over and patted Rocky's hand, adding, you ladies order us wine. She flashed a mischievous smirk. I can tell we're going to have a fun lunch. She rose, folding a napkin into her chair. I'm going to run to the restroom. I'll be right back. As soon as she left, Jen leaned into Rocky. What the hell was that? Rocky touched up her lipstick in a compact mirror. Oh, calm down. 
This is softball. Birding? Rocky cocked her head. Okay. The birding was part lucky guess. I mean, look at her. I shouldn't still be asking, Jen sighed. Enlighten me, please. Snapping the compact closed, Rocky nodded toward Dot's phone, sitting face up on the table. Her lock screen is a quote, I noticed when we first sat down. I assumed she checked the time with the compulsive nature of a grown woman with few friends. The quote read, simplicity is the final achievement. Francis Chopin, I believe. The quote combined with her slender fingers and the musical notes adorning one of her two cardigans, Jesus, Jen, two, said to me, this woman fancies herself an amateur pianist. She began studying the wine list. Jen slapped the laminated menu down to the table. Birding, please. Oh, sorry, yeah, the birding. Well, she wears two pairs of glasses, not bifocals, other than just being weird as fuck. I'm assuming there's a logical reason. Most likely, she has trouble peering through a set of binoculars with bifocals on, and her haphazard style of dress, besides being sad and homely, is pieced together like a traveler of the state. The croc sandals, Lord help her poor little heart, are not your typical croc purchased wherever shitty footwear is sold. They only sell those in an actual croc store, like the one in Hot Springs. If I remember right, which I do, the only place you can buy a tie-dye dress made out of strips of patchouli-soaked fabric discarded by hobos is that Jen nodded, remembering the Jonquil Festival, the crazy couple with the booth who played nothing but Grateful Dead. And the reading glasses string, those beads, the only place I've ever seen anything like those was the creepy guy with the monocle in. Jen chuckled along as she spoke and they said it together, Eureka Springs. Rocky nodded. So lucky guess, sure. But each of those spots, they have the nature draw, they pull in bird watchers from all over and look at her, come on. A waitress hovered over Jen's shoulder which led Rocky to pick the wine list back up and rattle off a couple of sweet white wines. When Dot returned, they all drank and talked, with Jen allowing Rocky to take the lead through pretending to find piano concertos and birding stories interesting. Rocky ordered a grilled flatbread sandwich that she smelled more than ate. She loved the way a smoky aroma paired with a crisp white wine. She breathed into her glass, letting the scents mix, as Dot said, I'm so glad I donated some money for your community outreach. You seem like such big hearted young ladies. She smiled into the distance. You remind me of myself 10, maybe 15 years ago. Rocky cut her eyes at Jen who sipped an empty glass and avoided eye contact. You, you already donated? Oh yes, dear, Dot nodded. Jen told me all about your project, wonderful cause. I couldn't give you enough to fund the whole thing, but it should help. It does tremendously. Jen patted the table and smiled. And I know how hard of a time you've had, so I can't tell you how much we appreciate you. Rocky cut her eyes back and forth between the two. Jen twirled a French fry and shook her head. So terrible. Have the police gotten any leads? Rocky pursed her lips and kicked Jen under the table. No, I'm afraid not. Dot hung her head and poor Waverly. She looked up wide-eyed. We're all living in fear. Jen nodded, frowning. You're so right, something. She glared at Rocky. Must be done soon. I agree, before we see another tragic turn. Dot put a hand on her cheek. The irony is, I don't even think this man, this home invader, is dangerous. Rocky rolled her eyes hard at Jen and poured herself more wine. Jen wrinkled her nose at Rocky and prodded Dot. What do you mean? I hate to ask, but what happened? If you don't mind sharing, I mean. Dot shuddered, but her eyes took on the twinkle of someone sitting on a story they'd been dying to tell. Well? I was home alone. David was on call, and he had run up to check on a patient. She blinked at them both. My husband is a doctor. Yeah, we'd made the deductive leap, thanks. Rocky drained the last of a bottle and whirled it at the waitress for another. Jen punched Rocky's leg under the table, which caused Rocky to titter at her like a frightened meerkat. But she relented and forced out a sober. I mean, this isn't about your husband, Dot. Our only concern is how the calamity affected you. Dot squinted at her and nodded. You're right, Rocky. 
absolutely right. I was terrified and alone. The young man stormed through the downstairs living room. Did you, did you get a look at him? Jen asked. Rocky wobbled over the table. You, you say that as if you have an upstairs living room. Yes, we do. Huh. Jen nudged Rocky's arm, causing her to almost hit her head on her plate. Dot continued. He wore a mask and a ball cap, black, plain, dingy. So no, I couldn't see his face at all. White man, average height, had on an army green field jacket. He was lightweight, but he must have been burning up. He rummaged around, picking up things, and tossing them like a savage. Horrible. Jen clucked her tongue. What kinds of things? Dot looked at Rocky's confused grimace and shook her head. I, I don't know, family photos, keepsakes, searching for valuables, I presume. Did you go downstairs? Jen showed gen genuine concern. Do you, do you own a gun? Dot and Rocky answered in unison, no. Rocky coupled her answer with a tipsy chuckle. Jen kicked her under the table. Rocky responded with an up and down wave of her hand in Dot's direction. Fortunately, Dot closed her eyes when she answered and shook her head with them still squeezed shut. No, 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 we detest violence. I did call down to him though. I asked him very politely to leave. Rocky opened her mouth and Jen shoved a fry into it. Dot continued. He was so polite. As soon as he spoke, I must say I felt no fear. I'm not suggesting he shouldn't be arrested, but I do not believe he intends to hurt anyone. What did he take? Rocky chewed at the fry and motioned with a smile for the approaching waitress to fill her glass. My son's Adderall out of my purse. That's it? Jen reached across for Dot. Your poor son. Can you get more medicine? Dot waved off the concern. Oh, sure, David can get a prescription refill. I just tell him when we need more. The bottle was practically empty anyway. By the end of their third bottle, Jen helped Rocky stumble to the car. Jen chided her for over drinking, but was too excited about what they gleaned from the robbery story to stay mad. In the car, while Rocky leaned back with her sunglasses pressed tight against her face, <clears throat> Jen bounced in her seat. So what do you think? I think she should stop being a damn Democrat and buy a gun to protect her family. Rocky, you're a Democrat. Rocky shot a finger into the air. I am not. I'm a social progressive. What's the difference? My purse has more guns than a Democrat and less money than a Republican. Jen sighed. I know you picked up on something. Picked up on a check, Rocky mumbled. Thought a rich doctor's wife was paying. I would have stopped at two bottles. You know, her husband, Rocky interrupted her, stop right here. I don't want to hear about her husband. All these women are so preoccupied with their husbands. We're women, capable women. We don't need men to prop us up anymore. All right, before you burn your bra, run in here with me for a second. Jen nodded toward a house. Shelly drove for a short ways before whipping into a driveway of a two-story colonial house in an older neighborhood on the Texas side of Texarkana. Rocky stumbled out of the car, retorting, Joke's on you, wise ass. I'm not wearing a bra. She peered over her sunglasses. Where are we? Jen strided up the front walk to the door. Elaine Maplethorpe's house. Rocky tilted her glasses so they rested crooked on her face. She closed one eye and took in her surroundings. Spinning and shimmering pinwheels on stakes filled the yard. An artificial tree made out of colored glass bottles stood on one side. A triangular rainbow flag hung from the front porch. Rocky did her meerkat impression again. Where are we? Trotting to catch up, Rocky reached Jen as Elaine Maplethorpe answered the doorbell. Elaine flung open her front door with dramatic flair. She could have been anywhere between 50 and 70, with silvery hair flowing down past her chest. Mixed among the long white strands of hair were colorful feathers. She wore a puffy orange shirt with purple stitching. Her purple dress crinkled and bunched at her bare feet. She wore several toe rings and countless other pieces of jewelry, bracelets and necklaces and rings. A fog of incense followed her to the door 
and she held her hands up into the mist as if she held it indoors. When Elaine saw Jen, she squealed. Jen returned the squeal in a lower decibel. Elaine pulled her into a tight hug, saying through gritted teeth, Jennifer, 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 I'm so happy you came to see me at my home. She released her and stepped back with wide eyes. What am I doing? Come in, please. Come in and let me fix you a drink. Elaine whirled and disappeared into the fog. Jen turned to Rocky and motioned her inside with a head. Rocky pointed into the house. You know this fortune teller? Jen responded by entering the house, forcing Rocky to continue following her at her heels. Inside, Elaine invited them to sit on her colorful floral couch while she retrieved some tea from the kitchen. Stones and crystals and tapestries littered the dark house. Elaine returned with a tray of tea, steaming with a faint trail of jasmine-scented smoke. She poured them each a cup, apologizing. It's a little weak. I'm so sorry. Would you like some sugar? How do you take your tea? Cold and sweet. I don't like hot liquids. Jen elbowed Rocky, knocking off the sneer Rocky gave to the cup offered her. I mean, this is perfect, thank you. I like my tea like I like my men. Transparent, bitter, and disappointing. Elaine smiled. You must be Rocky. I've heard about you. Rocky pretended to take a sip and set the cup back down, raising her eyebrows in a nonverbal compliment of thanks. After Elaine poured Jen a cup, to which Jen added several spoons of sugar, they settled into small talk for a moment before Elaine sprung up. Oh, Jennifer, let me get you a check before I forgot. Rocky turned to Jen as Elaine scrambled off and mouthed, check. Jen nodded and Elaine came back to the room writing a, in a checkbook. I can only donate a thousand, but every little bit helps. Such a wonderful cause. Oh, this is more than generous. Thank you so much, Elaine. Jen nodded and accepted the check with a bowed head. And here with, she paused, eyeing Rocky. Everything you've been through. 